All right. Today's guest is Paul Donovan. Paul is the director of competitive swimming, Jersey Wahoos. He, uh, He's been the head coach at the National Aquatic Center Performance Center for Swim Ireland. He was there for eight seasons. During that time, he had uh, supervision represented Ireland at every level of the sport, including Shane Ryan, who is a Rio Olympic semifinalist, Barry Murphy, London Olympian, Olo European bronze medalist in 2013, and countless others who broke more than 50 Irish records during that time and won more than 100 national titles. Um, recently, though, he's moved to America permanently to be head coach at the Jersey Wahoos. So, Paul, welcome to the show. How are you? Doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to chat with you. Yeah, and I know you're one of the first people that I received comments from that uh, you're excited about the podcast. So this is great to have you on. Yeah, well, I think, you know, podcast is a great new way of um of learning and, and sharing information and you know as a few of them have come specific to the swimming world i've just always been so excited to be able to sit down and spend you know as we just said 30 minutes of your car journey actually doing something a bit more productive than maybe just listening to the soccer results from back home from yesterday evening right well i'm not listening to soccer results but i know <laughs> <laughs> i'm checking my football results right so <laughs> Um, but like, let's just first start with that. So obviously, you know, you're in Ireland, you grew up there and then you come here. I know you worked with Greg Troy for a couple of years, at the university of Florida, and then, and then you came back. So what do you think the really, the differences are maybe between club swimming in Ireland, swimming in Ireland, and then swimming in America? Um, it's 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 a completely different in, environment i think at the most base basic level um purely from a numbers point of view when you look at the numbers of, of people involved in in competitive swimming in in the entirety of, of ireland versus just a, a single lsc uh, in the us i think that's the way i've kind of compared it to people back home that you know like i'm in the mid-atlantic lsc here in 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 the the states and you know, we've got over 11,000 competitive swimmers, over 130 competitive clubs. Um, you, you know, that would be your similar size to the whole whole of Swim Ireland. But the other thing that's different as well is probably the level of professionalism that, that's in, in surrounding the, the clubs. And I don't mean that in terms of the, the competence and the expertise of the coaches, but I just mean that purely in the terms of um, how many of them are focused full time on developing their clubs as as environments for young people to excel in, as as businesses that, that have to be able to be sustainable and survive in the long term. Um, you know, if we even look in, in my local area here, we have we have four teams that are are um, maintaining full time coaching staffs. We don't have that uh, back home in Ireland. Um, we probably have a handful of coaches working full time across the whole the whole country, um, that are outside the, the central system. You know, that yeah. are working in club swimming. So from that angle, it's very, very different. Um, and then just the numbers involved in the clubs, there, there's, I can't think of any clubs back home in Ireland that, that control their own pool time. That whether they own the water or, you know, like yourselves tied into a, a bigger institution like a, like a high school or, or a university or anything like that, that's just not the way the, the system is set up back home in Ireland. Most of the clubs, their biggest challenge is around finding pool time. Um, yeah. you know, adequate pool time, available pool time. Um, so they're, you know, getting getting what they can and doing a great job of pulling all together and, and putting putting a service out there for the kids. But there's there is no Jersey Wahoos in in Ireland. Like you know, we own our own own water, we own our own facility. So right. you, you know, I get to come in and get to look at what's best for the kids and what's best for the the program and set it up that way. And that, that certainly wouldn't be the case uh, back home in Ireland either. So, you know, I guess what you're saying is we have it pretty good here, number one. Yeah. <laughs> right? But uh, so how how do you find success in Ireland given the constraints that you have on facilities? Um, so it's a really good question. Um, and um, I'm probably – you know, it could be quite a quite a topical one if you were back ho back home in Ireland. My answer when when 
I, when I was entering into, you know, coaching as a full-time profession, um, and I was lucky for the age I was at and the time that was going on, there was a, there was a, a movement to, to uh, centralize the, the, the training system a little bit, and, and that opened some, some full-time opportunities. Um, and that was, at the time, the, the path that, that I went down to try to give myself the opportunity to, to chase my own personal dreams of what I wanted to achieve in my career. Uh, and you know in the sport of swimming as a coach um so that you know that that was the way that, that a lot of full-time positions opened up in ireland back in let's say between 2004 and 2010 and um, was that a few of these centers opened up created some full-time positions um but you know head coaching assistant coaching positions and, and stuff like that and um but what it didn't do is it didn't really filter back down in, into the club system and it didn't right. create any more opportunities down below so you know once these new positions were created it didn't have a trickle down effect um to, to create more professional opportunities for for coaches down below at the club level um so they still got their work cut out for them right? they still have, they still have their work cut out for them and um, there are some just fantastic um uh, coaches back back in ireland if you look at the the olympic games from the the Summer just gone by there, and you look at the Irish team. There were there were several swimmers solely based in club programs that, that qualified for the Irish Olympic team. And to qualify for the Irish Olympic team, you have to go a FINA A time. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's not a slow standard. And um I know it, all about that A standard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you do from this summer. It was it yeah. was crazy. So you know, we there's two girls from club programs, uh, 18, 19, 20 years of age have been in those club programs all their lives that, that rose up and qualified for the Olympic Games. So despite the challenges, there are people out there, just like there are in the US, being innovative, being creative, being committed above mm -hmm. and beyond the needs of their club for these individual athletes to help go that extra mile and, and kind of help them you know, realize their dreams. So they might have to work it out for them. There are people just doing an outstanding job there too. Yeah. Um, and with England right next door, they obviously had a tremendous Olympics. And from your point of view, what do you think or what did you see that allowed them to have so much success um, in um, Japan? We're listening and, and talking to a few former colleagues that, that, that are based over there. There seems to be a collective feeling that, that COVID really, really, really benefited them. Mm. Um, and the extra time that they had – because they were able to keep their elite swimmers in the water. They just had this uninterrupted block of training. Right. Not just training, but I think listening to some of the coaches talk about it, uh, they really came together during that time. So they had this uninterrupted block of training um, where they weren't worried about performing at the next meet or you know next weekend, and they were able to just get on with it. And also they came together, and it was just that kind of perfect storm um, and and they've been they've been knocking on the door for as long as I've been involved in the sport. And yeah. um, they've had really good Olympic games um, going back to you know 2008 um, with Rebecca Adlington. Um, so I, I do think, and this is just my personal opinion, is that w one of the challenges that all not all many of the European countries face, and Great Britain included, is because it's such a centralized system. The demand to perform all the time is is quite absolute. Um, so sometimes the ability to take that step back and look at the broader picture um, doesn't always isn't always possible. Even though people might want to do it, because there's a demand and a pressure for them to be successful all the time, because there's an investment being made in them centrally by the by the government whether it's in Great Britain through the lottery funding that, that really generates their high performance sport, you know, in, in Ireland, it's more, it's more direct investment from the government through our uh, department of uh, tourism and sport. Um, and with that investment though, becomes a, yeah, a huge amount of pressure and demand to be good all the time. Right. And uh, I, cer I certainly saw that and felt that when I was working in my position. And I know from talking to, to colleagues in different countries that that was something we were all dealing with. Yeah. Do you, you know, the one thing I noticed here, you know, at Carmel, and I heard this a while ago, especially with the men, is you need 
like kind of like an alpha dog leader, someone to get out there and like clear the path. And once he's doing it, other athletes follow. And do you think we've seen a little bit, a little bit of that with Adam Peaty? Like here, I'm, I'm the man. I'm gonna, you know, you can count on me to be great, to win medals, to get you on this medley relay. And now that we have mixed, it's just a. I think there's, there's some sort of that that I've seen, but I have no idea. Um, well, I think one of the British coaches, Ben Titley, who's now based in Canada. Um, I remember watching Ben talk. It's probably ten years ago now. And um, he had a saying that it, it only takes one. Yeah. Um, and and for sure, there's there's absolute truth in that. I think at any level of, of any performance pyramid is that, you know, breaking boundaries for the first time is the hardest thing to do. And once one person does it, people start standing up and go, well, if they did it, why not me? Yeah. Um, and I think it really helps if that personality is a is a uplifter and a positive influence and a motivating factor for their, for their teammates. And um, yeah, so I, you know, I definitely think you see that in, in a guy like Adam, but did, did, I think Great Britain have had success for an extended period of time. Like James Guy won a world yeah, championship going all the way back to 2015. Mm-hmm. And um, James Gibson, who's the, the head coach in one of the ISL teams now, he won the world championship. I won't even try to guess what year it was, but <laughs> you know, it's probably 20 years ago now. Right. Um, so I think sometimes I, sometimes I think looking from the outside that Great Britain is a, they're a victim of their own, um, their own, their own goals, that the goals are always so high that sometimes they've forgotten that how successful they've really been. Right. Um, so, well, the other thing that comes to mind is just the Jamaican, you know, track sprinting, you know? I mean, they're incredibly successful, and you just need someone again. You just need one, right, and leading the way. Not, not that they hadn't been successful before. Yeah, but right. So yeah. Uh, now, just um, switching gears here a little bit. Now that you know, you've seen, you've been international. You came over here. You helped with Greg. But like, what have you seen? And what would your, you know, what's your general take on American swimming? And where do you think we can get better? you know, from, from an outside and not that you're an outsider, but you know what I mean? From coming in and you've been here a few years, but. Yeah. Um, we'd like, you know, one of the things you always hear from American coaches, um, when they speak is that, you know, one of the reasons for, for their success is that they have that individual ability to go and chase, chase dreams and chase goals and try different things and fail and learn and move and grow. And I think the most important thing for a country like the US is is never to lose that. Yeah. Um is never to lose that 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 individuality. Um because I think sometimes the thing I always heard was, you know, where the US is so good because it's so big. And there's an element of truth in that, but I think it's the size allows the nation and the swim community um to do certain things and try certain things and go in a few different directions and um the big push into that in my experience in in high performance sport um and working in it was the big pushes to centralize everything um right. and the best way the united states can stay ahead of the game is in my opinion is to make sure that they they don't um, go down that path and they keep the individuality and the freedom um, that that I, I've seen in my, my three and a bit years here because um, it's what makes people great. Yeah, we well, we tried that. That didn't work too well back in, uh, I don't remember when it was, but uh, I mean, there was a few medals out of that, but um, now, yeah, it's just interesting because it's going to evolve. It's going to change, you know, and you know, being on the being on the steering committee myself, I heard kind of the inside talk and you know how we're going to get better and our relays didn't perform like they should. But you know, I think the question like you pose is like, okay, how do we keep our individuality and get better? And you know, I do think it comes from club swimming and guys like like you who are, you know, you're getting it done. And I know we talked about how numbers we are, but. When I heard when you and I met in Greensboro, you were telling me you're a five, six to lane, and here you are at this, you know, meet swimming real fast. So, 
what what do you tell or what should we be telling the the club coaches out there today you know that i mean i think you're bringing that perspective but would you agree because i mean i think you got it pretty good even though i don't know i think i don't know so so uh, and again just just personal opinion on sure. things but um you know if, if you look at the when i look at the landscape i'm, I'm working with Dan, we look at the then the main goal I had when I came in and took this job was that we want to be relevant at the national level. Yeah. And um, that was a big mindset thing that we wanted to bring to the table and talk to the kids about and um, talk to the families about and, and get them to understand what that means and, and what that, what that involves. Because one of the things I was surprised at when I kind of started looking back after my first year here was I was surprised at how uh, parochial things are. Um, how, how localized the, the focus can be um, within our own competitive swim community. Um, and I was very keen to, to be play a central role in that lo local part of it and, and be a participant and a leader in it. But also, we also wanted to keep our eyes open to what's going on at the national level there and be able to jump out of our local situation and, and, and compete at the at the whether it's at a pro swim meet or in the summertime when it's really important going to junior nationals going to senior nationals going to futures when going to the highest level of available competition and that's been a big philosophy of what we brought to to our kids and to our parents here is that our goal is we want all the kids to be happy and successful and that's going to happen at a load of different levels but the other thing we want for all of them is we want them to experience competition at the highest level of available competition to them as individuals. So whether that's going to senior nationals, going to Olympic trials, <coughs> um, whatever that may be. And I think that to me, from the US point of view, when you talk about all those things, um, and I know this year was, was a different year with COVID and the, the meets were split into two parts, but I was still surprised at the low numbers. Um, when we actually got the site sheets for Greensboro, um, and um, and you know my 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 picture coming in from the outside was you know because I've been to a few U.S. Opens and stuff like that with the Irish team, was that these things are massive events with with really really high level of competition and loads and loads and loads of depth that's going to challenge the kids to learn how to be fast in prelims and be even faster faster at night at finals right. so i think keeping that national level focus at the at the club level is is really key now on your team are you talking to all of your coaches in your groups like we are going to go to the fastest meet possible no matter what i mean is that how you're thinking about it yeah that's that's our philosophy as we go to the highest level of available competition and would you say and i'm not really familiar with uh the middle middle atlantic lsc does that the common thing in there or do you think you stand out in that way um i don't there are definitely plenty of teams that do that as well but mm -hmm. not every team does it and then that's totally fine that's right. when you go back to one of the strengths about yeah uh, about u.s swimming um but i think you know maybe going on from our lsc kind of culmination onto the next level there, there's not a ton of teams doing that. There are definitely other teams doing it. We're not unique like that. Um, but not everybody that could does. Yeah. And, um, you know, talking, let's just talk training philosophy. You, you, you seem to have, you know, you work for, for Greg Troy and I you kind of had some distance swimmers. Would you say you, you still be a believer in that aerobic foundation and how do you, if it is, how do you instill that into your program? So, yeah, um, you know, I, I spent time and under, you know, uh, Coach Troy as a volunteer assistant and under Coach Wilby and Coach Nesty, who were yeah. there also at the time. I also spent my my eight years in Swim Ireland. I worked for, for Coach Peter Banks, um, <laughs> who, um, you know, is, uh, yep. again, not dissimilar to me. He's, he's Irish by... By birth and his first half of his coaching career was back home in Ireland before he moved to the US. And we were lucky enough that he came back um, and took on the national performance director's role in 2009. So, um, you know, Peter would be a, a great a great friend of mine, but more importantly, a great mentor of mine when, when I was working 
and someone who really helped me develop that philosophy because I was quite young. I was 26 years of age when I took the, um, the National Centre job in, in Dublin um, and Peter was a great, great support um, to me in that time. So to go on my, on my own philosophy and how that's developed is that, first of all, I think everything works. And one of the goals we have in the program here at Wahoos is we want to expose the kids at all levels to everything. Um, not, not just one thing and not just one way. Um, we want to expose them to, to everything. We want to expose them to all four strokes. We want them to expose them to all the components of all four, four strokes. We want them to be able to kick and pull on all the strokes. Mm -hmm. um, we want to do different drills with them and you know, not the same ones all the time. Um, we want to get them better underwater. We want to get them better on starts and turns. Like everything helps these kids get better. And one of our jobs is to help them be able to take that next step into into college at the end of their maybe 10, 12 years here. Um, so the first philosophy we have is we have a philosophy of range and that we want to expose them to everything. Um, within that, yes, we do have a training curriculum. Um, that we work off. Um, the first part of that training curriculum is we want to develop great technique. Um, but the next part of that training curriculum is that we want to develop them really well aerobically. And all aerobic means to me is that we're um, doing more repetitions of things correctly. Skilled aerobic. Yeah. Um, now, not perfect. And I think sometimes there's... My experience has been when you try to make it perfect all the time, you get caught in this no man's land where they're not doing enough reps to even get a little bit better. Um, and they're getting frustrated and we're getting frustrated because it's not what we're looking for. So what I try to say to the kids all the time is that, hey, pick one thing and just try to do it better than you normally do. Mm -hmm. and all those tries will eventually add up to you walking into the pool one day and having that eureka moment you know what how did that happen yeah said, well because you've been trying to do it differently for for so long now so when we're doing our aerobic work or just our training um you know we develop it through the program you know we develop training intervals for for the different training components that we're doing and um, we develop training volumes for the different training components that we're doing and um and we try to link you know that the top end of each group ties directly in to the bottom end of the group above them so that they're ready to make that transition um, and they're ready to hit the ground running and ready to feel a part of that next group up so you know when when i say i'm always looking at the highest level of available competition what we say to the coaches of an our age group program and our development program is just get them ready for the next level up in wahoos so in the same breath, are you talking also, is there like a common language that's, are we using the same language when you talk about the necessary times and training to get to that next group? I mean, how does that work in your program? Um, yes and no, because what I don't want is I don't want five or six Paul Donovan's coaching yeah. um, in the program. And I try to reflect this back on my own experience Um is that you know, um, you know, in my previous role, uh, not from a coaching point of view, I didn't like being micromanaged. Mm -hmm. um, so if I didn't like it, then there's a good chance that, that the staff that are working with me now won't like it. So yes, we try to give direction, um, but I also want them to be able to express that information, um, however they feel the kids they're coaching are going to take it up best. Because the other thing is that I'm not on deck with them all the time. You know, that, that's that's their space and right. that's their opportunity to, to to be free and to try different things. And some things will work and some things won't. And I don't want them not to do something because they're worried about what Paul might think about it. Um, I just want them to feel comfortable coming to me and saying, hey, I tried this. It didn't go great. What do you think? Or to go, hey, Paul, I did something that works so great. I think I'd like to share it with the rest of our staff. Um, so do we have a common language? Certainly in, in the office when we're communicating with each other for sure. But I, you know, I want those coaches to be able to walk on deck and, and be themselves. And they know the kids better than I do. So if they right. think saying something some way is going to resonate more, 
I want them to feel free to be able to do that. Yeah. So what do you think is the biggest challenge that club coaches in America face today? Um, you do dealing, dealing with young people. I don't, I don't know if this changes. So I'm not a, a big believer. You know, people talk about generations changing and all that. The generation I'm coaching now are light years ahead of the generation that I am actually from. Um, so I think the kids are only getting better and better um, in terms of their ability to engage and their willingness to engage and their, their commitment is outstanding. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is just um, there's a lot of pressure out there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and pressure is a good thing, but as soon as it turns into stress, that that's not so good for, for anybody. So I think keeping the kids stress-free from the pressures they have academically, um, the, the massive pressure that's on them performance-wise in the sport of swimming, just the unsaid thing that they're competing against the, the whole rest of the nation are trying to get a, 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 a you know part of their education paid for. So the NC2A is the greatest asset um, to United States swimming. But I think it's also something that we need to manage with the athletes we work with, that they don't get overwhelmed, disheartened, discouraged, um, and a, a little bit broken from the, the process of, of chasing their dreams. So I, I think just keeping them stress-free is probably the biggest challenge that, that we face. Yeah, I find it uh, amazing that there was the – what you brought up because last night um, I'm at home and my friend Ian Murray calls me and he's, and he's like, Chris, these kids, uh, they're stressed. What, do you find the same thing? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So to hear all three of us kind of like come to the same conclusion. And I think it's, I, I just told him, I said, we just need to keep having conversations because I don't think any of us are going to solve this. We all recognize it. It's clearly happening in different parts of the country. So I think we just need to continue to create avenues and conversations among staff and among athletes to get there. But I, I don't know. I mean, do you have, what do you think is the solution? I know stress-free, but how do we, how do we do that? Um, well, I, you know, talk, communicating is the answer to everything. Yeah. Um, um, in my opinion, um, if you have good lines of communication, at least you have the opportunity then to, to change it. I'd also uh, loop parents into that as well um, and say that, um, you know, between between the, the three people involved, you've got the athlete at the center of it and you've got their, their parents at home who love them more than anything else in the world. And they're their coaches who, you know, love them pretty close to that as well. Um, so that's a really good starting point for a conversation for a kid to have their, their family at home and really supportive people not at home that want what's best for them. Um, and just keep talking to each other um, because, you know, we had a situation a, a couple of weeks ago where a parent reached out to me uh, about their kid being really overwhelmed with something and I didn't see it. I wasn't seeing it, you, you know, in, in the training pool. I didn't know that this stress was going on and that little bit of information from, from home allowed me to look at things through a different lens taper what I was saying and how I was delivering in a little different way and just make that kid's experience a bit more positive in the moment, uh, you know, until maybe they, they just figure out what what was causing that stress. Um, myself and my wife say, talk about this all the time, how happy we are that, you know, social media wasn't around when we were in, in high school or in college. <laughs> yeah. um, so, like, that's another stress that the kids have that, that we didn't have growing up, so... I think they've got that that performance pressure around you know, you know the whole college process. They've got the social pressure that's on them, and uh, academics, just like swimming is getting faster and faster. High level academics are getting harder and harder as well. Yeah. So I think, as you said, just by communicating is the best way to give them the opportunity, and we just try to loop the parents in as as much as possible. Yeah, great stuff, Paul. I love. Uh... I, mean, I feel like I could talk to you all day because we're going through the same stuff. So, um, all right. So we're going to switch it up with our fun, fast questions to wrap it up here. 
All right, so we'll keep it a little bit lighter. I know we got into some, some depth there, but um, if you could do a social kick with anybody at any time in history, who would you do it with? Oh, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson, the former Manchester United manager. All right, I yep, read this book. Good. Uh, what song would you least like to come up during your workout? Uh, call me, maybe. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you too, but uh, yeah. um, if you could post a billboard at the pool for everyone to read, what would it say? It only ends once. Everything else is just progress. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. What would be your perfect I am order? Um, I, I haven't swum in 20 years, so. I don't know if there's such a thing as a perfect I am order for me anymore. Um, but no, you definitely have to get the, the fly out of the way um, up front. Um, but then I'd probably like to get the breaststroke out of the way straight after it and keep so the back. So you fly breaststroke. Yeah. yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, kickboard or no kickboard? Kickboard. Okay. Would you rather be in a pool that is too cold or too warm? Too cold. Too cold. Oh, okay. You go in lane leader or caboose? Caboose. All right. And what's your favorite Gatorade color? Yellow. Yellow. Hmm. I haven't heard anyone say lemon, lemon lime, right? Yep. All right. Paul, anything else you would like to say to people before we uh, finish up? Um, no, just thanks so much for having me on. I'm, I'm like you. I could sit here and, and talk all day long about these things. Um, but I do think, um, you know, the other thing that I've really enjoyed about, you know, the last three years of being in the U.S. is the coaching community. And, um, you know, it's another massive, massive, massive strength that, that we have around us here and such a great resource. And things like this that you're doing only make it all that more accessible as well. So it's a really enjoyable part of, of the job. And I hope these things continue for a long time. Yeah, me too. It's been fun. And um Keep up the great work out there in, in Jersey, and I'm sure I'll see you on the pool deck soon. Right. You too, Chris. Thank you so much.